So I don't know if you guys heard this, but um, there was recently, I think like as of this weekend, so China actually passed a law that limits online video games to three hours a week for young people. So what this law basically says, so for those of you who don't know, um, <clears throat> when you play an online video game in China, this is, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I've, I've talked to people in China and stuff, but this is my understanding, is that you have like a national ID that, you, you know, anytime you sign up for a game, like you link your account in game to your national ID. And so then what, they, what they've essentially done is they've like instituted this, this law that you are not allowed to play games like Monday through Thursday at all. So all of your accounts are linked to this national ID. And so they like don't let you play those games. And then on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you're allowed to play, I think, one hour a day. And they may even have restricted it from 8 to 9 p.m. You also get to play one hour a day on holidays. So China recently passed this law. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about it, you know, why I think this is happening. And then also like, you know, what to kind of expect going forward. So the first thing to understand is that um, video game addiction is like a big problem. And we don't quite understand what the relationship between video game, the increase in playing video games and a group of social movements is. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's stuff going on in lots of different countries. So in, in, you know, the U.S. and Europe, we'll call them NEAT. So these are people in not in employment, education, or training. In South America, they're called NINIs. So ni trabajo, ni estudiar, people who are not working or studying. Um, in, in Japan, you know, I think they call them hikokomoris. Um, and in China, actually, recently, there's been like a big movement called laying flat, which is that there's a group of young people who uh, are sort of like not engaging in like the work culture. So China also recently passed, um, their Supreme Court made a ruling that the 996 work culture, which is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, is actually illegal. So there's this big culture, and if you're Chinese, you know, feel free to correct me. This, I'm sort of hearing this secondhand from uh, colleagues of mine and friends of mine in China. That, you know, there's, there's sort of like young people there are just not like not interested in working. Like they're not interested in you know, grinding all day, spending six days a week, 12 hours a day for like a small amount of money. And then like, you know, getting on this, this, you know, stair stepper of like walking every day and getting nowhere and eventually getting promoted and stuff. There used to be a lot of, you know, pride that people took in this kind of sacrificial work culture. Um, you see that kind of that, that sacrificial work culture in Japan as well. You see it in the United States. You see it in residency for sure, where people are like, you know, I worked a hundred hours a week and it was like, it was terrible, but man, I survived. And like, you know, there's like this really like machismo kind of like culture where the harder you work and the more you deprive yourself, like the more, you know, credentials you get, the harder you train, the more badass you are. There's this kind of like sentiment, right? But what's, what we're seeing just across the world is that Younger people, right? So we're talking like starts with the millennials and Gen Z are just not signing into it. And so people have hypothesized that video games are a big part of this. I do think that they are a part of that. But I think that what's happening is people are demonizing video games for essentially like a lot of other societal problems. So, you know, are video games kind of addictive? Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're going to talk about that in a second. But I think that what people here are missing is that there's a confluence of events that gets young people uninterested in participating in society. And then when I choose not to participate in society because I don't get paid enough, I don't get enough respect, I don't enjoy my job, it's not fulfilling. When all of those things happen, right? I'm, I have tons of this student loan debt. When all of those kinds of things happen, then I choose not to participate in society. And when I choose not to participate in society, what do I do with all my time? And so what I end up doing with all my time is like video games, right? So I think that there is an addictive component for sure, which we'll get to in a second. But I think essentially what's happening is that there's a great deal of unrest with young people, right? So people are concerned about climate change. They're concerned about wealth inequality. They're concerned about all this kind of stuff, which are very valid concerns. And so people are taking a step back and saying, you know what? I'm just not going to play this game. And what they turn to is video games instead. There's also really interesting, I'm going to try to dig up this reference for you guys, but I saw um, 
you know, this is a paper that a buddy of mine at Harvard Business School sent me about young people's uh, young people entering the workforce is at an all time low. So historically, like in the last hundred years, especially young men are at an all time low for entering the workforce. So it used to be that the demographic that entered the the workforce and the most stable, solid demographic of people kind of going into work were like young men, like men between the ages of 18 and 25. And for the first time, like that number is like remarkably low. And people are trying, economists are trying to figure out, you know, what's the reason for this? Chances are it's multifactorial. But I think what we see is that people are not entering the workforce and they end up playing video games. Like what's going on there? What's the cause? What's the effect? I imagine it's like somewhat circular and reinforcing, right? So video games make it harder for people to enter the workforce. And when people are not interested in then entering the workforce, they end up playing video games. But I think what you see is a lot of institutions and governments and policy makers, what they're doing is they see a bunch of young people playing video games and they say, that's the problem. That's what you see, right? It's like the tip of the iceberg above the water, but it's not it, that what they don't ask themselves is why are these young people playing video games? Like, sure, they're playing video games, but what's the root cause? What's driving the behavior? All they're sort of focusing on is the behavior itself. And this is something, you know, you learn if you work in addiction psychiatry is like you can, and, oh my God, I'm about to go off on a tangent, but you can take an alcoholic and you can send them to rehab for 60 days where there's no alcohol available. And this is the business model for like half of the rehabs out there. They're like, we're going to take you to this awesome spa-like place where we're not, you're not going to have a choice to drink because there's no alcohol available. So what we're going to do is remove the problem from your life. And that's what we're going to call a rehab. And these rehabs are, are fantastic because they don't address the underlying issues. They don't address the drivers of behavior. They just restrict the behavior artificially. And so people go to the rehabs, they get sober for 60 days, they feel awesome, and then they go home and then alcohol is available. And what do they do? They relapse. And when they relapse, that's fantastic because you had such a good experience at that spa that charged you $70,000. I guess I need to go back because I had it. I, it was so good. So it's this awesome business model that, that, you know, encourages temporary sobriety and repeat customers. And so what happens is I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these like policy level changes where people are sort of targeting video games as the problem. And it's definitely a contributor. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's sort of like that's, that's the equivalent of taking an alcoholic and, and sticking them in a rehab and preventing them from sort of like playing games, Right. And that, that amount of restriction could help, it probably will help, but it's not addressing the underlying causes. And I think part of the, the other kind of interesting thing here, so I, I think what's going to happen is that the, the law will pass, and hopefully it'll help some, but I think two things will happen. Until you, when you have a bunch of gamers who want to play video games, they'll find a way to play video games, okay? So the first thing that a buddy of mine was explaining to me is that, you know, oftentimes, like, like you have a national ID, right? So it's like linked to like your driver's license or whatever. Like, so you have a national ID then you're a minor, you're a 16 year old kid. Like what 16 year old kid is going to do is go, they're going to go with their grandpa's national ID and they're just going to sync that with all their accounts. And then it'll lift all the restrictions. They'll keep playing games anyway. It's not hard to find someone's like national ID to link because grandpa's not playing video games. Like you've got grandpa, you've got grandma, you've got mom, you've got dad, you've got your great uncle. You've got a bunch of people out there who aren't playing video games. And you've got a bunch of national IDs, so you're just going to keep playing. And I think that's what's going to happen. So as long as the driver for the behavior is there, you can try to like suppress it, right? Like you can try to restrict. We see this in addiction as well, where like, you know, you're, I, I, you know, there are kids who smoke pot and their parents don't want them to smoke pot. They're addicted to pot. So what do they do? Like they find a way to smoke pot chat. They find a way to sneak out of their, their house, you know, put a ladder outside their window, climb down, their friend meets them in their backyard, they pass them a joint, like they find a way to do the behavior. So I think it's an interesting intervention. I think it's kind of an authoritarian approach that doesn't address some of the underlying problems. I'm not surprised that the, the passage of this legislation came now because laying flat in China has been growing so much. So like people have noticed, right? So I heard about it, right? And I'm not like in China. So I think that there's a there's an increasing amount of like frustration and dissatisfaction with young people. And so like policymakers are looking at that and they're saying, oh, video games are the problem, right? It's these friggin' video games, like these stupid video games. We see this from parents as well in our parent program where like 
you know, parents will come in and they'll say like, how do I get my kid to stop playing video games? Because like the video game is the problem. The video game is like the absolute, you know, that's the real problem. Like, how do I get them to stop? And what we do when we work with these parents is we like, hopefully the ones that work with us begin to realize like the video game is a symptom. It's not the root cause. And that if you really want to get your kid to stop playing video games and you want to fight them constantly for it, what you need to do is like get them on the same page and help them understand how video games are a problem and address the underlying issues. Sometimes it means getting your kid into therapy. Sometimes it means helping your kids succeed in ways that like they're struggling with, right? Sometimes it means being being like, okay, do you like, or, or do you feel or you're overweight and people make fun of you? Like, what do you think about like going to jujitsu class? Would you be down to do that? And then the kids are like, yeah, actually like that'd be pretty cool. And so then like the, the parent encourages them and it involves dealing with the underlying drivers of behavior instead of restriction. And when we do that, it works out really, really well. So I think what's happening is this, this measure is somewhat reactionary. I think we're going to see a lot of people bypassing it because that's what gamers are going to do. They're going to find a way to play games if they really want to. Um, and at the same time, I think it's also like in response to a growing dissatisfaction that young people have. And they're sort of blaming the video game for it. Now, speaking of blaming video games, I'm not surprised that this legislation passed for a couple of other reasons, and I think we're going to see more stuff like this actually all over the world. Because the truth is that video game developers are actively trying to make their video games more addictive and more damaging to people. So like what people are trying to do, right? So like, like you know, MMO makers, for example, are trying to find ways to get people to play the MMO for longer and longer and longer, right? Like you want that lifetime customer, like you want people to play your MMO for a decade and charge them their 15 bucks a month. And so game developers are actively trying to make the games more addictive. So I think that, you know, if you look at some of these um, online like arena games, right, like Fortnite and stuff like that. What you actually find, I was, it was really interesting. I was trying to like figure out why kids like playing these games so much. And I think what they've done that makes it really interesting is they've affected the rate of encounters, right? So they do this very, very well. So they make it so that you can never relax in a game of Fortnite because you never know when you're going to encounter someone. And they shrink the arena so that like, you know, once the player count kind of dies down, Every few minutes, you're going to run into someone. So you need to be constantly paying attention to the arena. Like you have to always be like paying attention, but it, it never gets to the point where there's like a constant, uh, it's not actually constant. It's like a random encounter, right? So like on in a six minute period, you may encounter three people in the first two minutes, or you may encounter one person at, at one minute and one person at five minutes. So they've done a really, really good job of like, engineering the situation that is very addictive for the brain and keeps people really, really excited to play because you can never really relax and encounters are not so common that they become like boring, right? So if you think about like grinding mobs in an MMO, like there's a lot of like stability to that. Whereas in some of these online like battle arenas, like what you essentially wind up with is like this kind of really interesting random encounter schedule, which is consistent enough to where you can never relax. And that's actually very addictive for your brain. And I'm seeing like growing amounts of dangerous unrest within parents. And I think that if video game developers are not careful and they continue to make more and more addictive games, which I think they're going to do, what we're going to wind up with is like a cigarette kind of situation where the negative impact of games is so profound that you're going to have governments like China. It's going to start with China, but it'll happen elsewhere too. Mark my words. You're going to have parent groups that rise up and will be like calling their congressmen and stuff and saying like, we want you to ban this kind of game. As the addictive potential of games grows, What's going to happen is more gamers are going to get addicted and more people are going to start to think it's a problem. And then what, what will probably happen is people will come down hard on the gaming industry. And the gaming industry may fight sort of like the, you know, the tobacco industry did in terms of saying, oh, no, they're not addictive and stuff like that. And they'll even find people like myself who will say like, hey, there are positive effects of video games. They'll find people like myself who will say, hey, like, you know, find the root causes because I actually believe that stuff. I do think games are addictive. And I believe that they're, if you really want to conquer addiction, it's not about restricting the substance. It's about protecting, you know, the underlying psychological drivers, right? That's what you really have to address. But I think if we see this trend, we're going to see this a lot more because as, as games get more addictive and as more lives get ruined, like governments, parents, and societies like won't stand for it. And I think that 
you know, I don't know how this is going to affect, you know, Tencent's, Tencent is a major video game developer in, or publisher or whatever company in China. So I don't know how it's going to affect their bottom line. I saw, you know, one figure that said that like, you know, their income comes from 3% of their income comes from miners and 97% comes from non-miners. So it may not affect their bottom line, but I think it's like, it's just the beginning. And so if we're not careful, like as an industry as a whole, and we do not support the mental health of our, of gamers, like you're going to see more regulations like this and parents are going to come out and they're, you're going to see like lawsuits and you're going to see all kinds of crap. You're going to see like congressional hearings. You're going to see it all. And so I, I think you can, the last thing that I'll share with you guys is just a page from like Darwinian evolution. So, you know, a lot of the, the bacteria in our gut at one point infected us, right? So I don't know if you guys know this, but we have for every one human cell you have in your body, you have 10 ba ba uh, bacterial cells. So you have 10 times as many bacterial cells in your body as you do human cells. And so essentially what happens is that when, <clears throat> when, when you have an infectious agent, if you want to survive, what you need to do is become symbiotic. And what that means is that you have to deliver enough value to the organism to where the organism doesn't try to kill you. It actually like is happy with you hanging out because you bring something to the table. And I think the video game industry and games in general are, are, are at a really crucial tipping point. So games do do good things. They like, they were, they were somewhat, they helped us somewhat be resilient during things like the pandemic. You know, people like my wife who like aren't gamers, like had trouble with social interactions where I was like, I'm going to play Dota. Like, that's what I did before the pandemic. It's what I'm going to do during the pandemic. It can actually help a lot. But if the, if the gaming industry is not careful what, and, and we continue to make more addictive games and more damaging games, games that bankrupt your player base, what you're going to actually get is a situation where like you're going to get a Darwinian response and then like people are going to say, hey, these things actually hurt us more than help us. And then you'll start to fight against it. Whereas I think really the direction that we should move in, because I, I love video games, is to become more symbiotic, right? To like have video games be like a healthy part of your life, but not an unhealthy part of your life. For video games to be a, a, a way that you can interact with people and like form connections with like people and have those connections be real, have ways to find support. And at the same time, like all of those positives, like being balanced by, you know, just a, a, the right amount of engagement. And if we don't, like in the next five to 10 years, I think we're going to see a lot more legislation like this. I don't usually make predictions chat, but I mean, I'm seeing it. We're going to see a lot more parents getting really, really upset. And then like, you know, once the Facebook moms start going to town on something like it can get bad real fast. So, you know, I'm not surprised that China passed the legislation. I think it's like a signal of things to come if the industry continues moving in, in the direction that it is. And at the same time, I think that the legislation is sort of like addressing a small part of what I view to be like a much bigger problem.